What does the oil see in its first hours of life? So the dispersant binds to these deposit precursors or varnish precursors, these reactive uh, molecules, small molecules floating around in the oil from the, the, uh, uh, in, from the blow by. Uh, and that's the only thing that dispersants see. What these um, deposit precursors or varnish precursors do is they stick to hot metal surfaces and then they polymerize or cross-link with their neighbors and form a film. The film starts out clear, so we call it a lacquer film. It turns slightly amber colored and then that, we call that now a varnish film. They keep heating it up, leave it a little bit longer and it turns black. Now we call that a carbon film. They're all the same thing, just at different stages in life. But, but that's the, 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 the life cycle of the, the deposit. Uh, we also um, find that combustion water reaches an equilibrium pretty quickly in every engine. And depending on how hot your oil temperature is, and how hot your ambient temperature is, and your cylinder head temperatures, that will determine how much water is um, in, in your particular engine. It's important to have enough oil consumption in these motors. They're designed to use some oil. They're not like car engines. Um, people used to boast about their Continental engines using, you know, one quart in 35 hours. And that's wonderful until you have to have a top engine overhaul of 400 hours because they were not using enough oil. Usually one quart in four to 20 hours, I say, perfectly acceptable. Outside that range, you might want to take a look and see. Um, some people put in additives, um, but within the first few hours, those additives uh, uh, evaporate. Over the next uh, 10 hours, this person's keeping up, it's, it's doing its job, keeping the engine clean. Um, but the, uh, the, the water that has collected is picking up some acids that the dispersant didn't get to and it's um, becoming um, somewhat corrosive already. The blow-by fuel rushing past the piston rings can actually get in behind the piston rings and before it gets into the oil and actually cause deposits. And so these deposits um, are, are what we're concerned about as far as uh, uh, piston ring wear, uh, cylinder wear. Um, maybe some of you have noticed in your engines that your first quart of oil, you don't use any oil after an oil change, maybe 12 hours, 13, 14 hours, but then the next six hours, you use a second quart. And go. How come it's more on the, with the oil, uh, with the, a little bit of time on the oil than it was with fresh oil? That's because the oil actually becomes stickier from the collection of these uh, heavy uh, fuel molecules getting in there. It actually uh, it, it creeps into the combustion chamber more easily. Then your oil consumption does increase with time on the oil. In the final hours of the engine life, we usually add one to three quarts of oil. Um, that gives a good shot of uh, dispersant and, um, and antioxidant. The, the varnish precursors, these reactive molecules, are overwhelming the dispersant. And now you start forming the varnish, lacquer, or the lacquer varnish, or carbon deposits you know, in, throughout the motor. These varnish precursors can also combine with the lead bromide particles from leaded abgas. The leaded abgas, um, lead scavengers, lead uh, um, uh, ethylene dibromide that combines with the lead to get the lead out of the combustion chamber. But with all the blow-by coming in, it brings in a lot of these little tiny lead bromide particles. 
information when you look at just lead bromide particles, it kind of resembles talcum powder. And it's throughout the engine. It doesn't cause any problem at all. They're soft, they're, they're, they're very small, they're, they're one micron in size, very small, they don't cause wear, they don't cause any problems. Until they're captured by this glue of the varnish precursors. And then you have lead sludge. And maybe some of you have seen lead sludge. It's, it resembles lead butter. It's really neat. And if that gets into places, hot areas, like a valve guide or something, it can bake into a carbonaceous gooey mess that, that comes hard and sticks valves and it's very, it's very difficult to do it. So here is a Cirrus engine at 800 hours, completely painted with dark amber varnish. They were doing 50 hour oil changes. This engine has a smaller sump than normal for this size engine and it stresses the oil even more and uh, obviously not even cam guard. What's the uh, capacity on that engine? Well, it says the, 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 the stick says eight quarts. Most people would have to run it down at six to keep the oil in the engine. Yeah. Yes. Would you uh, say that that oil was probably run very hot, uh, say well, well above? No, oh, no, no, no. Cirrus is, and, and I, as I believe this is an older Cirrus, um, and they run very cool. So if you, if you found that on a overall, mm -hmm. what would you recommend going from there? More frequent oil changes? More frequent oil changes, and certainly using camber. Question? Yeah. Oil oh, oh, capacity. The term you put in 12 quarts of oil, the first two quarts get blown out. Yes. Physically, how does it get blown out? Every engine, whether it be a car engine, airplane engine, diesel engine, likes to set its own level. That's by the design and the construction of the engine and the way that the engine is oriented in whatever it's in. So they'll all reach their own level. The manufacturers say think they know better and they just arbitrarily say, well, it's not arbitrary, it's how, how much fuel do you carry determines how much oil you need in the engine. Um, but if an engine only wants 10 quarts of oil and you try to artificially put two more in there, it'll blow it out the breather and end up on the belly of the airplane. And, and I don't care how many times you do that. There's no way to train your engine accept that last two quarts of oil. Every engine sets its own level. Um, you should start out what the uh, manufacturer recommends. You fly for, for 10, 15 hours. At that point, whatever that says on the stick, that's what you should put in the maximum next time. There's an example of that lead butter sludge. Um, scoop it out with a knife. Very, very heavy because it contains so much lead. So this is found throughout the engine, and, and, and usually in the low air, the low flow areas of the uh, oil, oil pan. Um, this uh, is centrifugal force um, throwing it out inside the crankshaft. So the hollow crankshaft oil flows through, and it separates it out this way. And um, it can cause a lot of problems with. Uh, uh, stuck oil control rings. We're finding lots of people that have this problem. So I recommend um, uh, 25 hour, 25 to 35 hour oil changes. Um, I recommend for, for most people. Um, the engine should be, uh, there's a, quite a bit of discussion whether or not you can just train, change the oil, drain it when it's cold, or fly a plane, get it hot, but then you put all the oil back up into the engine, it takes a long time to drain. Um, I, I'm thoroughly convinced it's much, much, much better to warm up the engine by flying the airplane, getting everything hot, um, doing your normal maneuvers, whatever, because that will um, loosen up as much of that sludge, of those lead particles, and to be drained away, and then you drain your oil, but let, yeah, let it drain overnight. It's fine, and you get the last of it out, but you'll get much more sludge out of your, uh, your engine if you do it hot. 
You should always cut open your oil filter, or a can of cut open your oil filter for a look-see, um, because you, you, it, it, there's no reason not to. It's, it, there's a wonderful way to peek inside your engine and see what's going on. You look for metal, very important. But uh, you'll often find carbon and other stuff, band-aids, whatever. Um, very, very useful tool to, to cut and inspect the oil filter. Um, organic acids in the, in the water that exists in your engine is very corrosive. I've seen people just run their engine on the ground for 10, 15 minutes uh, in the winter time in the fall. You know, they can't fly, so they think they're doing their engine a favor by, by running the engine for a while, recirculating the oil. Little do they realize they are producing lots and lots of liquid water that collects in the valve covers and then drains back into the engine. So it was 40 degrees, preheated the engine, six-cylinder engine. We started it up, ran it for 10 minutes, shut it down, uh, left it for four or five hours, came back, pulled the valve covers, and poured liquid water out of the valve covers. Don't do that. <laughs> Um, really, there's minimal neutralization. There's a big difference between car oils and aircraft oils. Car oils have overbased detergents in them um, that can neutralize acids. They you know, chemically and physically they resemble dandelion puffballs with a center little core and then the detergent molecules surrounding it. That center core is calcium carbonate, Tums, Rolades, and it actually um, uh, neutralizes acids in the oil. However, we cannot and do not have access to those materials in aviation oils because the potential for um, uh, pre-ignition, once that deposits, those metallic deposits get into the combustion chamber, they can form metallic oxide deposits that glow white hot under combustion processes and can, can lead to pre-ignition and catastrophic destruction of the engine in a matter of moments. So, we have no acid neutralizing capacity. Therefore, you need to change your oil more frequently. And as I said before, and uh, <clears throat> what the uh, Lycoming engineer said to me, well, you can't filter out the acids of the water. You need to change your oil. I do like regular oil analysis. Doesn't have to be every time, but you like to see a trend for your particular engine. Um, it can catch things. It doesn't catch everything. It's inspecting the filter. It's 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 looking at the oil analysis um, and getting as many perspectives of what's going on in your engine as possible uh, is a good thing. Can I ask um, on, water, on liquid cooled engines, say a Rotax, do they, do they have that limitation? Is it just an air cooled engine with the ashless thing? Or is it yeah, Rotax engines, they, they use a different one. They use they can the use an automotive type? No, it's a, a shell designed three generation old motorcycle oil, basically. But it is different, it's totally different. It's much closer to car oil than aviation oil. So they don't, they don't have a risk of. <clears throat> detonation from ash because of its cylinder head temperature being lower? Is that no, the tighter uh, clearances. Okay. Yeah, they don't consume as much oil. Nowhere near. They're much more I just bought a low-tech engine and they recommend motorcycle oil. It's, yeah, which is what the shell oil is like. Yeah. So, are, are you... Um, it sounds like it would be better when you come in to just go right to the hangar and shut it off hot rather than coming to the fuel island and then starting it up again to taxi back to the okay. hangar. Because every time you start up, you're going to get some condensation. But then it's hot. It, it, it would evaporate yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. You know, you have people that want to argue with me about pulling the oil cap off and they see a little moisture go off. That's fine. I think that's great. I mean, whatever you can do to get the water out, it, it's fine. But, you know, can't get too crazy about it. Heated valve covers? <laughs> yeah. A, a little bit further on the run. If you're, not, if you're unable to fly it for some reason for months, would you recommend giving it to your, Giving the keys to a friend of yours that you trust <laughs> and having him fly it. And, and if not, 
than using a, uh, a, pres a preservation method uh, for, you know, if you know it's not going to be flown for a while, you're working on your medical, whatever. So, yes, if you know it's not going to, it's going to be sitting for a while, you want to do something. Okay. A 20 weight 50 safe versus a 100 weight, mm -hmm. which is a 50 weight. Which is better for long-term survival against moisture or the thinning okay. of the, okay. the bed? That's a very good question. When I hear it fairly often, so which oil is better for rust protection, a 20W50 or a 50 weight oil? And then that goes right to the film thickness question. So if you take panels and dip them into two oils, and they can be hot, they can be cold, whatever, um, but Usually, uh, I like to um, 15 no. um, I, I, I like to do it with the oils hot so that they're the same viscosity, and then I usually put the panels into an oven and then let them cool down slowly. And then, so I, if you touch the panel, you see it's a really thick oil film. It ends up being the same thickness, makes no difference in terms of, of the thickness of the oil and, and, and Phillips. That's their claim to fame that the oils are the same thickness. But neither one of them protects against rust. You put both those panels into a humidity cabinet, and 24 hours later, you see rust spots growing right underneath the thick oil film that you can touch and feel and really, really thick. There's no protection from the oil film by itself. It requires rust inhibitor additives. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that cam guard, do that? Yes, that's what cam guard's designed for.